You know that question last night about would you go and confront a shoplifter? Yeah. I'm like, bro, you guys have never met a Māori mother, eh? Māori <laughs> mother be like, oh! I, I, I love that he, he kind of he, 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 he kind of put these kind of curls in the tail. You know, he's like, it's not like would you tackle a shoplifter. It's like, what about a 13-year-old? Like, he's probably, he's probably big for his age, but he's, he's 13. Yeah. Yeah. And they're both like, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> This is Gone by Lunchtime. I'm Toby Manhai with Ben Thomas, Annabelle Lee Mather. Morning. Morning. Kia ora. Uh, Sam is helping us on produ- producing, the, making the magic happen. How are you going, Sam? I'm going good. I'm feeling I'm feeling mojo-wise. There, it's the morning of Thursday, September the 28th, and there is 94 hours to go. 94 hours to go until advancing voting begins. And we're going to podcast to all those 94 <laughs> hours beginning now. <laughs> No, we're not. It's going to be short and sharp because people have to be places. Um, today we'll talk about uh, yet another debate, the second debate, in fact. We will talk about other debates, perhaps, and we will talk about the El Nino effect of New Zealand politics. Winston Peters is reliably cyclic and easy to resist as the scorching wind ripping in from the west. <laughs> right. Let's do that first, shall we? Because it does feel like a turning point of sorts or certainly... A significant major moment in the election campaign when on Monday morning Team National had fed the, the script, I think, of the video to certain members of the media and then up popped Christopher Luxon in a uh, social media video saying, you know what, uh, it's a really important election, guys. Also. <laughs> it's a really important election, so also. Let, me, let me just wave you straight through to voting for New Zealand first. <laughs> I, well, oh. he's. I mean, they tried to they tried to extract a silver lining to engineer a silver lining was which was this is not going this is going to be close. Don't be complacent. Not a foregone conclusion. But Ben and, and and please and please please do vote for us and and don't necessarily vote for Winston because no. we will only work for him if that's the last resort. Work which, for him. <laughs> well, well, in in a way, I mean, yeah. they said, yeah, I'll pick up the phone to Winston Peters. Yeah. I will supplicate myself to Winston mm. Peters mm. if necessary. Mm. If that's what you, the voter, demand, I will b- crawl on my hands and knees. Which if, is rem- if democracy <laughs> demands it. Which is remarkable, given that he doesn't know him. <laughs> Never heard of her. <laughs> I mean, never heard of her. <laughs> last night, that was funny. Winston, who? <laughs> do, do you mean? Do you do you mean my mentor, <laughs> the Prime Minister of Britain, <laughs> who won the war? A really strange announcement. I mean, I know that there was a lot of pressure on, supposedly, a lot of pressure on Christopher Luxon to say, you know, to answer the Winston Peters question. <laughs> Will you work with Winston Peters? Now, he hadn't ruled it out in the past, which meant that he was... It was, know, imp- it was imp- implicit. Implicitly, he had ruled him mm. in. But, right? but he had also said, it's hypothetical. He's not yeah. in Parliament. He's not getting over 5%. Mm. And by this point, clearly the National Party polling was saying not just there was over 5%, but that they will probably be probing those numbers harder, and it's mm. probably a pretty solid 5%. It's not a not a, not a liquid one. <laughs> and then we had two polls this week, two TV polls, which put them over 5%. No, no longer hypothetical, very real, and it's just mathematics, isn't it? Oh, well, I mean, I think it... I think at this point you would probably say more, or sorry, say over the weekend, you would have said more likely than not that New Zealand First is in Parliament, mm-hmm. right? He probably did miss that window where he had an opportunity to join with Chris Hipkins and rule out Winston Peters yep. and signal to centrist, centrist, we'll say, voters who are not part of that lunatic fringe that Peters has attracted that actually, you know, this is not a viable option for changing the government and you kind of try and keep him below 5%. Now, a number of people thought that that would have worked. He probably missed that opportunity. At the same time, what actually happened was an entire day of coverage saying that National was willing to work with New Zealand First. Yeah. The, the implication there being that a vote for New Zealand First is not a wasted vote. If you are on the centre right, if you were planning to vote for National or ACT, you can now vote for New Zealand First instead if that's what you would like. Mm. And it wasn't so much as just raising a white flag. It was like raising a white flag and using it to sort of signal the the Winston Peters plane onto the landing strip. I mean... And so people who only play a kind of glancing attention 
to politics, i.e. I, normal people, see the headline, which is Luxon rules in New Zealand first. No, not just people who only pay a glancing attention. I mean, this this was the, the most interesting thing I thought about the announcement was, first of all, that they went so big on it. You know, they had briefed every journalist and supplied the script. The The, the video was, you know, a reasonable production value one that... I, um, I, I got a supporter email about it, you know, because mm. I was signed up to all these. It was, in the, it was in the fifth paragraph, was it? <laughs> no, no, no. It was, a, it was, a, it was right, right out there, you know. And so they went really big on this announcement. Yeah, you're right. There was that, you know, in, in you know, down the end there was, you know, oh, we won't want to. It's our last choice. But, I mean, that that's sort of like going into a trade me discussion and saying like, Okay, I don't want to, but the lowest price I will accept is this. Yeah, and, <laughs> you know, and, about, and it's like five bucks think, or whatever. I think what it shows is that Luxon and National are no longer thinking about winning the election. Like, in their minds, they've already won the election, and now they're thinking about the type of government they want to form and engineering a situation to help create that. So they don't... And I think partly this is really sort of acts own fault by some of the statements that were coming out in previous weeks about supplying confidence and what, what a, how a coalition might work. I think that Luxon doesn't want to deal with a big, strong act. He wants to subdue them and he wants to lower um, Seymour's expectations of, of power mm. in a newly formed government. And so he's saying to people who might be sitting on the fence between New Zealand First and and ACT, we will work with New Zealand First to try and split that vote and have like two little monsters as opposed to one you think giant monster and a grumpy old man. Deliberately encouraging people to vote for New Zealand First who I are on that so, fence. That's what I think, I mean, that's the opposite yeah. of what he's expressly saying, but I guess you could say they argue that that's Well, why else would you subtext. say it? I mean, the, the other know, part of it that I think weird or difficult or paradoxical is that he's going, also, I think Winston Peters would go with Chris Hipkins if it came to it. He's saying, this man is implicitly untrustworthy. I do not want, I don't think this man is is, is a reliable partner. I will partner with him. Well, I, th- I, think, I, think, that's, I think that's the 4D chess thing that they're, they're, they're attempting, right? Or at least they've, you know, they seem to have briefed some senior journalists they're attempting. You know, Audrey Young, I think, wrote about this, that they're trying to bring in the spectre that if you vote for Winston, look, he could just as well flip on the day, flip on the night. If he had the balance of power, he'd install Chris Hipkins in a heartbeat. And that's true. If Winston held the balance of power, all promises are out the window, as they have been always in the past. And, you know, we're only a $4 billion provincial growth fund and an upgrade of the Dargaville airstrip away from a third term of a Labour government <laughs> supported by Winston Peters. And, uh, you know, it is, it's really hard to figure out what, act, what National are actually trying to do strategically because, you know, I, I mean, you, the scenario of trying to degrade Act's vote in favour of New Zealand First would sort of it would make sense, but some people, including um, Hooten and I think Gordon Young, have said what National is looking for is a sort of arrangement like John Key had with Act in the Māori Party where he could tax centre or they could tax right, depending on the issue. But... That that doesn't that, the doesn't, don't work. that doesn't work if you need both of them the to maths, pass the legislation, yeah. which is how the maths is right yeah. now. And so, you know, and and I, I think your your scenario works, and Hooten I think would probably agree with us if if National's inclination was to not really do much at all and kind of manage over the status quo mm. with a few kind of banner things and a bunch of sort of you know. Um, baubles, I guess, for the partners. And and that may be what they they want to do. Um, but I, I can't see how opening the door for Winston Peters makes things any easier. And I think encouraging uh, centre, you know, telling centre-right voters that, you know, however you feel about it, you, the blisteringly popular leader of the centre-right on 23% preferred Prime Minister, right. a, a spiritual leader of your people, um, you know, <laughs> expressing your feelings about their vote, you know, may not be highly influential. Um, and so, uh, you know, I, I can only see that it sort of weakens their position. I, I just, and, and more so, Luxon was invisible on Monday. He didn't do any interviews about it, and, and I assume that was to avoid situations like last night's debate where... 
he was sort of floundering, you know, saying, oh, no, I do agree those statements by that New Zealand First candidate are extremely racist. But no, of course I'd go on to I coalition. Mean, I mean, the, 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 the reason they did it now is because they knew that Christopher Luxon, even though it had become implied in his response, which was saying nothing, that obviously he would say he wouldn't work with him if he wouldn't, so by omission he was going to. But he was going to face more and more questions, including questions of the debate last night, which we'll get to in a moment, and that was going to become a kind of major storyline, and so they wanted to knock that on the head. Strange the way they went about it. But also the other thing, I think, is that... Everyone's saying he could have ruled him out and, 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 and might well have done that. I think, he sh- I think he should have. I think that would have been the strategically smart thing to have done. He also could have ruled him in a long time ago. To do it at the 11th hour, just a few days before advanced voting, looks to me, it, it, it looks to me weak, you know? Uh, John Key didn't always rule him out. He sometimes ruled him in, but he did it months, months in advance, sometimes at the start of the year, and he'll say, yeah, this is the situation, then you just totally take the air out of the issue rather than making it something that builds up to a point that in the debate last night, Christopher Luxon accidentally at one point appeared to say that he would consider making Winston Peters prime minister. (laughs) (laughs) I mean, there was a... Yeah, and and the other thing is it completely... Like, Active had no oxygen this week uh, as a result of that because all of the talk has been about Winston Peters, which is a nightmare scenario for Act. At this point in the cycle, which is when everything is Which is four days before voting starts. I mean, this is the last... Which, again, is why I think they did it on purpose to take the wind out of Act Mm. sales. Should we talk about the debate a bit? Um, Annabelle, it was definitely, it seemed like we've been talking a lot about where's the mojo gone in, in, um, in New Zealand. Uh, and it looked like Chris Hipkins had been storing it in a drawer. Mm. And then he just mainlined it ahead of the debate last night on News Hub, moderated by Patrick Gower at Q Theatre in front of a bigger audience. Definitely a bigger energy. And it came out, we talked last time about how the energy he had at the end of the first leader debate was the energy he needed to start with, and he came came with that and more, didn't he? He really leapt out of the traps. He um, he brought all of the energy and, and more, like when you have fireworks and then you just, like, store all your stuff up and let it all off at the same time, that's very much how it felt. It, it, to be honest, it felt a little bit rough at the start. It felt almost too much. Would, I, yep, but there were moments it, when it became too much, yep. But then I think it levelled out and he played it really well. I I realise that Labour have been in government for the last six years, which puts him at a disadvantage in terms of National being able to point to their track record. But there's also opportunities where I feel Labour could be talking about National's track record, like when he talks about the health system being under crisis, in crisis, sorry. Like it was only six years ago that there was sewage leaking from the walls at Middlemore Hospital when Labor took over from National. So, yes, of course it's in crisis. It's mm. been massively underinvested in. So I, I, I'm kind of, uh, I don't know why Labor isn't making more of that. It has only been six years. It's not like it, they've had nine yeah. years in Parliament. <laughs> it's still six years. I mean, they, they, also, they run that line years, on... They but run I that... mean, you know, you can still point to the, you know, Disinve- or the lack of investment that's happened over successive governments over successive decades. So. They, they they do that, run that line, for example, on police, that, you know, it was mm. the police numbers that fell under national... Yeah, the, I mean, but I don't know why they don't do it more with health. The, the, um, the other... The other there, were, there, were, there were various moments that... that um, I agree, it looked like Hipkins who might have overcorrected. Mm. And this, you know, once you start looking belligerent and hectoring, then that, or desperate even, then I think don't think people respond to that too well. Like someone was clearly prepared. He had a bunch of lines ready to go, calm down, mm. dear. And at one point he said, he said he wanted to give Hipkins a hug. And yeah. it was quite quickly after he'd also said he wanted to legalise um, MDMA, I think. So, <laughs> you know, just, just put those two together. But, the, I mean, the, the danger, Ben, is... And something like that. And there were moments when I thought, hang on a minute, Chris Hipkins looks like a really effective mm. leader of the opposition here. <laughs> and Chris likes it looks like an under pressure prime minister. Yeah. You know. And I think I think that's that's a win for Luxon, even if Hipkins is being more effective, you know. I, I mean, how does that play? It's hard to tell. I don't necessarily suggest we can psychoanalyze the response of a reviewer. I think in terms of the inter- no, I think in terms of the internal coherence or narrative of the campaign, you know, Hipkins was the underdog coming in. He's be- um, yeah. you know, not to reference one of our competitors, uh, Newsroom's Raw Politics 
Joe Moyer uh, told this anecdote about being on the campaign trail with mm. Hipkins where they were walking to an event and they were at the lights with two women dressed in their graduation drink alia. And she said, you know, Hipkins was Minister of Education for five years. He's currently the Prime Minister. He's campaigning for re-election. And she said he just sort of stared straight ahead and didn't sort of say, oh, congratulations or, you know, great, you know, can, you know, great day or whatever. Um, you know, he's been just this bizarre sort of introvert, almost hermit on the campaign trail. Um, and he kind of sprung to life yesterday. So I, th- I, I, I don't think that... You know, the idea that sort of like some look prime ministerial hip kittens looked like a scrappy underdog. I mean, that was how they were coming in. You know, that was how everyone judged the first debate and how everyone has judged the campaign so far. So I, I thought he went okay. Yeah, overcorrected a lot of stuff. We got a bit. Um, I think he was. I think he was pretty poor form on Luxon's religion uh, and and sort of ju- jumping at shadows. And uh, and I think uh, you know Luxon gave a good answer. You know, in terms of you know suicide for um, LGBTQI plus youth, um, you know, said we'll have a Minister of Mental Health, we'll prioritise that area. And then Hipkins took this extremely sort of ungracious sort of like, oh, well, it's being gay isn't a mental health problem, Christopher, you know, which is, I mean, obviously kind of no, but the I point think, when it's about suicide prevention. No, but I think he made a good point about, about you know, it's about creating a society of, of, of tolerance. It's not just about mental health services, it's preventing mental health issues from developing but not making our our uenuku whānau feel like, you know, the that they don't belong as part of our society. I think the other thing that Hipkins did really well is pointing out to people and reminding them throughout the debate how many questions Luxon wasn't giving a straight answer to. And I thought, you know, for a visual medium, it would be so good to have like a scoreboard um, every time someone fudges a question and doesn't answer it, and then at the end you see, you know, it's telling when people that won't answer a question. It says a lot by literally not saying anything, and I think Hipkins um, was good at alerting, you know, the the audience to it every time. He, that he happened. did that, and he also did that thing that we talked about that he didn't do in the first one, which is he eschewed the need to channel every response via the moderator and turned, yes. pivoted, and went direct. Again, probably too much. Like at one point <laughs> I was keeping a tally and it was 10 questions that he'd levelled mm. directly at Luxon and this was, you know, probably about the halfway point. But it's a really effective thing to do. You know, you don't have to you don't have to have everything mediated via via that kind of V axis. Yeah. And, and, and I think when, when we, you know, when you were watching the two participants interact, you sort of could kind of forget that these were two sort of everyman on 19% PPM each or whatever. Sure. Um, but then when it came back to the questions from Patty, you sort of saw kind of the calibre of these leaders versus people in the past where pretty much everything Patty threw to them, they were like, yep, we'll chuck that in our, <laughs> our policy <laughs> document. <laughs> <laughs> I, think, I think we had the current Prime Minister committed to menopause leave for all employees, which, I mean, actually not a bad policy, but not, you know, n- none of this stuff is in, the, you know, the, the, the extended bowel screening, that wasn't in the Labour's fiscal yeah. plan that yeah. he had released earlier that day. <laughs> was it? Gower, you know, Gower got them, you know, committed to individually traversing the country trying to kill feral cats. <laughs> right. Which I'm really into, by the way. Oh, um, no, like, again, all good stuff. But 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 I think, you know, I think it shows two things. First of all, a bit of supineness, you know, on TV. Like, neither of them could neither of them could just say, oh, actually, look, we've got a plan in that area and it's this or our priorities are this. They were just like, oh, great suggestion, Patty. We'll chuck it onto the document. <laughs> chuck it <laughs> um, and, and, okay. you know, these working groups when you've got Patrick Gower. And, 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 uh, uh, but, but the second thing is, I mean, shit, if you were a minor party thinking of that you were going to be in negotiations in right. two weeks, you'd yeah. be loving this, right? Yeah. <laughs> you'd be getting Patty to negotiate. Yeah. Yeah, right. Can I just say that in terms of posing the questions directly, to Luxon, I think Hipkins did that to the greatest effect when it was the question about racism and he read the quote from the New Zealand First MP. Can I just say, candidate. though... Candidate. candidate yep. sorry. Can I just say, though, how disappointed I was with both of their answers? No, New Zealand is not a racist country. Do we have laws that discriminate specifically against Māori? Yes, we do. Check out Te Ture Whenua Māori land, perpetual leases, all of that. Do we have political leaders 
who regularly say racist things. Yes, we do. Do we have public services that don't serve brown people? Yes. Are brown people over-incarcerated? Yes. Yes, we do have a racism problem. And what really annoys me, and it came out in the panel as well, is that people are actually more offended by talking about racism than they are about racism. And I really wish that when they said, no, when there's racism, but we're not a racist country, that actually there'd been some interrogation of it. Why do you think it's not a racist country, given all of these statistics and everything we know? Well, that's Sorry, why guys, we need a. Makes me a bit that's why we need a mutter, mutter, mutter leader debate, don't we? Well, we do, you know, don't well, we? We we yeah, love debates, that, but yeah. um, we're not yeah, fun, everyone's flavour at the up. moment. Other debates. Um, well, just returning to that. Okay, it is it is it is increasingly funny seeing Chris Hipkins get more and more outraged by the idea that anyone would go into government with Winston Peters after he served in cabinet with him for three years, after Peters was his deputy prime minister, after. New Zealand First MPs over and over again breached the cabinet manual, sometimes over incidents of public racism that the Prime Minister Jacinda Ardern, uh, who Christopher Simpson's replaced, refused to enforce any sanctions on New Zealand First Ministers, including Shane Jones, for their racist comments about the Indian community in particular, uh, because they were another party and and, and Labour didn't concern themselves with that. And and this idea, you know, Chris Hipkins gets sort of so thunder. He see, he's like an ex smoker. Well, he, he's yeah. like <laughs> he's like, he's like an ex smoker. He just goes around going, "That will kill you! How dare you blow that in my face!" You know, <laughs> like. Well, he I also. Mean, I mean, there was one particular part in that in that response where he said, he talked about Winston Peters' character and he said, this is a man who says things like Asian invasion. He said that long before he went into... Yeah. President was went into government with him. You know, and, if, and it, fact, if that had been something that had kind of emerged in the last year or two, then you could say, OK, fair enough, look, this man is now something else. Same guy. Same guy. It's amazing in what we're willing to guy. turn a blind eye to yeah. if we've got a chance of getting a bit of power. Well, it's in, just in as well that Christopher Luxon has never heard of him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Do you have, I like, mean, a link? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Can someone forward Winston's Wikipedia page to Christopher Luxon? I Wait, thought that, Peter's Taiwanese guy. Uh, that, like, <laughs> that had to be the most telling point of the of the debate, I thought. When you can just flatly say, I don't know Winston. It's like <laughs> and, yeah, Gowan, Gowan's you response know. was very good. Everybody knows Winston. You know? Look, Luxon, <laughs> Luxon Luxon famously doesn't drink or smoke. He's, he's probably <laughs> never had any FaceTime with Winston. <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> um, let's talk about other debates uh, quickly. Anything else that has stuck out? Ben, you were at the, the New Sub Nation one. I saw you there. Oh, yeah. The Power Brokers yeah. one. That was pretty good. That was the first one. Um, you, you you skipped that, didn't you? Annabelle, you're meant to be there. The, but you which went one there. was? Oh, yeah, oh, yeah no, I... I I um I didn't get to that one, but I watched it. I thought Marama killed it. I think Marama, Marama Davidson was. She's been the MVP of the debate so far. I think MVP in, in the um in the in the cup of Maori one as well. She was yeah. she was strong. She, Honestly, if you watch that, you'd be like, well, we just should let Aotearoa be run by Wahine Maori, and we'll uh, be and we'll be much much better off. And I thought it was really cool to see the camaraderie between the Fanangatanga between her and Deb, it, it's quite compelling. Like, these guys are going to be leading the country and Seymour and and, and Peters can't even barely look at each other. It was quite, quite a funny tableau. It's <laughs> got to be <laughs> Yeah. Ben, who's your MVP of the debates? Any debates? Was, you would, did you watch the youth one? You're a voice of youth. I watched the youth one. The, the, youth, the youth one, these sort of off-leader debates are actually a good opportunity to sort of really kind of see who's got the chops on these things, right? So in the, in the youth debate, I thought Eric Stanford and Ardena Williams were pretty good. Um, you know, they delivered their lines. They were relatively fluent. Um, but, you know, Chloe Swarbrick obviously cut above in terms of the performance on the night. Um, and then, you know, then you've got, you know, these fucking weirdos like that New Zealand first ex-Shortland Streeter guy and um, who also has been hit by lightning 
Yeah, that's good. One of one of one of three leadership one of three contenders at the selection. Three based. known. It was three known. More. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Hunter Mackay. That was <laughs> his. That was his character on Short Easy. Hunter uh-huh. Mackay. Right. Yeah. Um, my favourite debate so far was the uh, Kopapa Māori one uh, that TVNZ ran. Mikey yep. Sherman, amazing. The Shermanator. Incredible. Mm-hmm. She was great. Yeah. yeah, she was really great. Um, you, you used to work with Patty at News Hub. Um, I think that was how she. That was her first non Maori media um, reporting job, mm. and you know, and it's interesting that those two, I think, have been by far the best and most energized. I think Mikey was better at keeping things sort of on topic and relevant to the election, as opposed to mm. Patty, who was sort of. And let's not just forget, this sort of Mikey, let's not forget, she had John Tommy Hedder, Shane Jones, oh, absolutely, and yeah. Willie Jackson to yep. contend with. She's yeah. got six kids. That's child play for her. She can like <laughs> run run rings around those guys yeah. any day. It is my. Great Great wish and desire that Mikey becomes the first Maori political editor for a mainstream. Yeah, she, she, she was outstanding. But I, I thought the, the candidates were really good as well. Um, and 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 it is actually interesting that you know by putting a Maori lens on it, you can actually get into the sort of substance of issues a lot better in this campaign um, because, especially because you've got these <laughs> people like Shane Willie, uh, John Tamahiri. Um, and he had Tamapotaka, who by default, because he, I think he just isn't sort of as aware of his policies and things, um, you know, they're, they're much more fluid. You know, Willie was saying, well, you know, my party thinks this, but I think this. You know? <laughs> Not to forget yeah. Karen Shaw from ACT, who's like, what's Te Matatini? <laughs> so that was almost like a who's Winston Peters moment. <laughs> I mean, like, you know, I mean, the, the, you know, look, there's, there's two things there. So the first thing is, you know, you do, you, you, you've got to admit, as some said, you know, Karen Shaw, she was raised, you know, she was, she was raised away from... You know, Tao Māori. <laughs> Me too. But, but at, the same, at, at, the same, at the same time, if you're representing on these issues, you know, you do need to know what's in the treaty and things like that. I thought it was actually interesting that Shane Jones and Tama Potaka both said, oh, Māori did so- cede sovereignty, um, which I think, you know, I mean, we sort of, that was something that sort of the Crown grappled with a bit, you know, during the um, Northland hearings, but it, it, it sort of... You know, you kind of go. Well, so, some people didn't. You know, some people didn't recognise they were ceding sovereignty. But you know, um, well, like, the Waitangi Tribunal's already found that they didn't cede sovereignty. So whatever. Yeah, yeah, that's right. I mean, sort of, and it, it doesn't really. Yeah. So, um, yeah, but I, that that was that was my favourite debate so far. Um, I think I got a. It's good debate. Yeah. You got to go. Yeah, I got okay. Bail. Sorry. All right. Ben's gonna go. I'll see you guys next week. Um, okay, we'll see, see you guys next week. week. Christopher Luxon's ruled in what outdoor. <laughs> 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 He's said, it's my last, last possible option. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, has he said anything about Brian Tom Have a good know. day. Um, any, anything else that has, has struck you, Annabelle? Now that Ben's gone, we can talk about serious things. Um, I, I don't know if there's any... I mean, there's been such a... It's been hard to keep up with all the policy announcements over the last week. Um, we've had all, all... Seeming like all the parties had a policy on... Um, immigration policy to allow different versions of visas for family members of migrants to come to New Zealand. We had housing announcement from Labour at a rally that I went to in Wellington, which was kind of old school, quite small compared to previous Wellington rallies, which were in St James Theatre and Michael Fowler Centre. This was at quite a small conference room, but it was quite big energy in there. Mm. Uh, we had policy on speed limits. National Party wants to increase them uh, Labour also doesn't wants to increase them, but not as quickly. It's kind of a bit of a odd one. That Na- the National Party wants to take all the traffic lights off the roads and attach them to beneficiaries, so yes. that they have orange, red, or there was a little mm. bit of a kind of, uh, and there was a, some some of the sort of classic throwback chat about beneficiaries in pajamas turning up to job interviews and anecdotally, climate change policy, Farmac. Funding, police numbers, tum to tum to tum. Did anything? Is anything? Is anything leapt out of that um, morass to you? One in thing that, terms? I've, that I've noted is that you know how in the election it's always like Maori migrants and beneficiaries that get cracked first, and so far the selection it has really only been Maori. Interestingly, because of COVID and all of that stuff. We're being nice to migrants for a change, and mm. like immigration is mm. not the you know, not being used to whip up fear and anger like it, it usually is. and But it had been all quiet on the beneficiaries front until recently. And I think, you know, it's during COVID, 
um, even though it was really hard for a lot of people, actually a lot of people did economically well out, out of COVID. You know, how their prices of their properties went up and all of that, mm. saving money on parking, working from home, like, you know, it was quite a vibe for some people. And so interestingly, when there was benefits increased and stuff around that time, th- there was barely any chatter or complaint about it. Now that we're in a cost of living crisis, it's so easy to tap into people's anger and resentment. And of course, you know, who would be doing it tougher in a cost of living crisis than beneficiaries? And yet we're managing to, our political leaders, some, Mm. are choosing to whip up angst against some of our poorest and most vulnerable people in society wanting, you know, we're hearing talk about, you know, small government and too much bureaucracy, but they want to go rummaging through the the shopping trolleys of, like, solo mums. What happens if you buy an eyeliner, you know, because you want to look nice for a job interview? You're in trouble for that. Like, it's um, pretty depressing, to be honest. There was, um, I saw someone noted that after that policy was announced, I think Derek Cheng asked, do you have any evidence base for this policy? Mm. And the response was, we think it'll work. And it's an interesting area across a range of policies, whether it's GST on fruit and veg, whether it's brick camps or or this. It's interesting that while we get, we demand rightly to see the spreadsheets and modelling behind policies that relate to balancing the books, mm. the, the fiscals, You know, a bit like you want a light to shine up in the debates when someone doesn't answer a question. Maybe we should be doing a better job as as media to say, let's draw, connect the line between the policy and the evidence base. Obviously, you can very you can have a range of different solutions. Mm -hmm. It's not like there's a there's a there's a single 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 solution or truth. But show us the evidence, and if there's evidence to the contrary, then why you think that that evidence to the contrary? doesn't apply. Oh, I totally agree. And remember when um, the Greens were, um, you know, um, wanting to have uh, th- uh, uh, something that, like, costs out everyone's policies and all of that and it's all transparent. Yeah, yeah. But there should be the same thing, but, like, it, you know, evidence for policies. And like you say, like, there's different ways of doing things and different types of evidence, to, you know, d- different types of arguments for why you might do something. But, like, at least present us some evidence that it's not just magical thinking or vibes. The other thing that I've found interesting in, in all of the debates is, you know, like there's been a lot of talk about gangs and, you know, all Portiki got brought up again last night, but no discussion at all about domestic violence, even mm. though we mm. know domestic violence is such a huge, huge problem in this country and probably, you know, in one of the key factors that, leads kids into getting into trouble, which leads them to jail, which leads them to gang life, and yet no discussion. No discussion about domestic violence and how we tackle it as a society and who's got solutions. The only person I've heard talking about domestic violence this election is um, Marama Davidson. Mm. Thank you, Annabelle Lee Mather. Thank you, the empty chair of Ben Thomas. Vacant as he's dashed off to another more important engagement. Thank you, Sam. We're going to go and try and um, find out who this mysterious character Winston Peters is and we will report back very soon. Kia ora.